Good morning. I'm grateful to be here. Usually, I'm the one doing the listening and less talking. But these days, I've been doing a lot of talking and listening. To back this up a little bit, there is something that is tangible that I want to share with you. Something that is very special. When I was asked if I would be able to come and share my story, my journey, I was in Uganda. In fact, I had just um, left the farm. I had just be, been picking coffee. But in that week, there was a word that's where Horace Speed works. So I went to um, a Baptist church in my local town where I used to be. And during that time, the word was on Joseph and Joseph's story on a Wednesday Bible study. And on a Sunday, you'll be super amazed. At that Sunday, we are talking with, we, we checked out this verse, which is in James 1, 2 to 4. But also in the same service, and that's where, for me, I feel that God is amazing and, is, and the Holy Spirit works so mysteriously. We read in Romans 8, 28, and that, when I was talking to um, Pastor Paul, when, you know, it was almost like I wanted to grab and say, what you guys are working through is exactly something that I've just studied, but I hadn't seen. I had not heard what uh, the, the, um, the series that you were going, going through. And when I, go, when I got the series, I was like, I don't think there is a lot of preparation I need to do. I will just pray to seek guidance. And that's what I did. Because the Lord had spoken miles away to be considered that there is something of value probably I could uh, come and, and share. Just like Joseph's story, there is a lot of piles that I have seen in my own life. Pastor Tim just alluded to, to part of that kind of childhood a little bit. I was born in a small village in Uganda on the side of the road. As the war, the Civil War of 1980s was ravaging through, my mother fell into early labor. This is 10 miles away from the nearest hospital. So she walked. So is my dad. They walked and walked until they couldn't walk. And also, her pain was so grave. So she decided to rest on the side. And my dad continued to see if he can find someone to help. No one was found at that time, middle of the night. I want you to close your eyes and imagine how dark in this part of Africa at that time, no electricity, nothing, in the middle of the night, walking this. If you're not eaten by a leopard, you're most likely to scare yourself to death. But she had to, because she was in pain. And this guy standing in front of you was saying, I want to come out. I want to go and face this world. Was it my choice? No, but she was, because of the labor, the war, the gun sounds, she was forced, or I was forced to come out earlier than planned. By the time my dad came, found my mother already, I'm already halfway. In that moment, when my dad 
shared that story and many other elders as I've grown and went really to seek my identity. I realized that I shouldn't have been around if it wasn't God. If I didn't die because of a war, I was meant to die because of the diseases that I had, so many of them because as a premature baby in Uganda's 1980s, the chances of me surviving were very small. I don't know all of you guys here, but I, in my life, until age of five, I might have gotten more than a hundred needles for injections for all sorts of illnesses. To this day, I don't like doctors. I, I had a very traumatic experience. But you see, this is where my life turns into a nightmare. At the age of eight, my dad dies. And his death didn't just kill him, but killed us too, emotionally. And so that is a very huge, important aspect, you know. And uh, there, is, there is a beautiful um, picture behind there that just brings back a little there where you are, what you see there. I stand there, I go there every year when I go to Uganda. That's the anthill, that's the hospital. My kids were all born in King's, King's, uh, King's College and I always you know, think about them and I think about myself. That's where, where I'm standing is the anthill. But the death of my father done something that probably as an eight year old would never want to experience trauma, but it also it killed my mom. She did not speak for a whole year. And because of that, I had to start life a bit early, earlier than you would want. But it was hard. At the same time, it was good. Good because I was able to support my mother. Good because I was starting to learn what it is to be a man. It's not something I would wish to anyone, but it's something that if we find ourselves in, with God's guidance, we should grab them and ask God. As life was, and this where for me, it brings this beautiful dichotomy to our lives. Because you ask yourself, why does going through that traumatic experience makes you excited about life? It did for me until when I was 12, 13, the good Lord called my mother. That was the start of my school of adversity. We all go through this school. And when you are an immediate in that school, in the classrooms, you don't realize what you're learning. It's God's preparation somewhat, I believe. You see, the most traumatic moment of my life happened just after the death of my mother. A week later, I was put in the room with 10 adults. And here we are. They were supposed to decide the fate of my life. 
any of you who are social workers here in this country or lawyers in this country, you know when they are deciding where a child, who should take custody, wise, who should take the child and that kind of thing. This was a family court, but belonged to my mother's side. In that room, something happened that all of you, you should listen to. And I'm gonna ask a question. And if you can, you can help me answer that question. Out of the 10 people, when this announcer or the chair of that meeting said, who here wants to take this young man and look after him until he's of age? How many of those people do you think put their hands up? I'll choose one or two people to answer. Oh, none. Okay, anyone? All. Uh, Wesley, you'll be, you know, be cheating. <laughs> um, you're right. None. No one put their hand up. This is something that allowed me to scan the room as young as I was. I looked through to understand what it means, betrayal, but also to understand what it means to be rejected. So any time in my adult life I've found rejection, I've encountered rejection, of course hundreds of times, but that rejection, especially the rejection from your own kind, the rejection from your own, I digress and sympathize with the young man, Joseph. You see, there are two things that that situation could, could go, two ways. And it did for my, uh, for, for my sister. Although she wasn't in the room, when I told her what happened in the room, she never stepped a foot in any of those family members who did not show up, put up the hand. And over the years, I've encouraged her to go and talk to them. Because of the choices we make as we encounter rejections and this kind of betrayal, it can take you into situations you don't want to, especially for us as believers. But to understand this a little bit, I'll skip back to the words of my mother just before she dies. She says, son, I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry. Of course I didn't know she was saying sorry because she's gonna die. But she alluded to that said, I'm sorry that I'm going to leave you in this world, this world where you have no one to help you. But I know that God will help you. Off I went, and I cooked the food that I was meant to cook. We were cooking outside on an open fire. An hour later, to get fetching firewood and preparing and come into the room, she was gone. So while I was in, the, in this room with these 10 people, adults, everyone thought I was seeing them. Everyone thought I was seeing, looking at them. I wasn't. I was seeing my mother and hearing her words. No one will help you in this place I'm leaving you in, but God will. Guys, I tear a little, not because of the pure sadness, but because of the foresight and the horror spirit that befell my mother before she died, to be able to give me such an insight. No one has ever preached to me to be saved. 
I got saved because God was looking for me. And because of his mercies, because of his teachings, because of the things that he was showing me along the way, by the time I was 15, I was an adult. In all ways of you can think as an adult now, the way you think about what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, it was as that. This is the school of adversity. This is where betrayal meets its friend. And I tell you, that chapter in my life has guided me in so many areas of my life. In decisions I make, in the rooms I walk, as I'll share as we go, there are rooms that have come in and you stand there and just say, God, you are amazing. But there is, um, there is a chapter that is so beautiful and that's really the, the journey that the Lord allowed me to do. And this is where I think um, you should never only look at the good times. So as I leave these villages and I decided that I have to leave this village, I, had an, I was given an opportunity to go and live with one of the elderly relatives of my mother. He was 83 years old. I had gone there to look after him. Just as I had looked after my own mother, I had become an expert of some sort of how to look after people in that way. It was hard, but he spoke to me. He was an unbeliever believer. That's contradictory, but it makes sense if I tell you. He is a guy who really didn't believe in the presence of God as we speak of him. But he believed in his powers. And he used to use these words. Sunday. Sunday is my surname, and traditionally will call you by your surname. Sunday. Don't you worry. God has got you. He's got you. God has got you. In Luganda, we say Katonda, God. Katonda Alinawe, the God is with you. And I kept really thinking, that's a theme that, you know, you already said. It didn't take long. He called me in his quarters, in his place. Usually when he was traveling, he would call me. So he said to me, I'm going to the city. If anything happens, I want you to go to Joshua's place. Joshua was his son. If anything happens to me, I just go, go to Joshua's uh, place and he'll look after you. This is a very healthy 83-year-old man. He has no illness. He went after a week, he hadn't come back. And after a week, he died in Kampala, capital city of Uganda. The wounds came back again. The trauma came back. I was taken to Joshua's place, and I stayed there as a foster. And while one night as I was praying, something that I had done from a very early age, I felt a very special feeling. I told my foster family that I was going to, to church, which was about nine, eight, nine, eight, nine kilometers away. It was a born again uh, church. And they told me, if you do go, 
you don't come back. They didn't believe in the same God as I, I did. I said to them, I would like to go. As a good African child, I insisted to stay and listen to the elders. Some of you will have that experience. And I said, what would I do in order for me to go the following Sunday? They told me you have to, to slash, uh, like clear a paddock from here to whatever. So every Sunday they increased it so that before I go to, to, to church, I would do this. So every Sunday was increased. And that was their way of saying, you know, I will make it. And believe it, every increase, I slashed it. And I went to church. But then I decided it was time to leave. I was just approaching 14 years of age. And I went and I left and I started to live on my own. You see, living on your own at that time, it's not a very African or Ugandan thing. It's not very common. But it's something that had to be done because I really wanted to go to church. So, and I moved and I started working. I think for me by now, I should be retiring. <laughs> I actually believe that. Uh, I should be retired now and go on a farm and grow more coffee. But because I started working very, very early. In this country, you call it child labor. In my life, we're calling it survival because it had to be done. And you see, similar, those pilots I was saying that they couldn't, couldn't be possible that the Holy Spirit was talking here um, and then in Uganda. We're going through these passages, and it, it's really amazing. So I moved on, and I started working for this organization. And this is what God's hand is, when really God has decided to, to call you and really be upon you, but if you realize and appreciate it or accept it. This is where. So one of these days, I go to the town as a, as a student. Um, you know, I'm working all, all sorts to be able to pay for my school fees, to be able to, um, to feed myself. I go to a playing field, and I found these Americans. They, you know, he was standing by himself there. Uh, and generally, I had this, I've had this thing that when strangers are in, on their own, usually if I see your face, I have never seen it, I'll approach. So I asked him, what's happening? How are you? Where are you from? What's your story? He said to me, no one has spoken to me today. Since I came here, everyone was. But this is a, it was a kid's uh, sports day. And he said something, what's your name? And I said, my name is Wycliffe. He walks back. So what's your name? And I said, my name is Wycliffe. And he says to me in his Texan accent, which I will not replicate, uh, and I won't try. Uh, where's, <laughs> I know my son will always uh, joke about it. But I decided, I told him, and I said, why, what's the name? Because I didn't know what the history of the name. And he says to me, why if he's a Bible translator in America, he's a Bible college, Bible translator, it's a very powerful name. So who gave you the name? And how, you know, can you come back with me? He asked me to go back to he with you know if I if I was free to go back with him. Listen to the prayer the wife said to me. Before my husband left, we pray that the Lord may bring some someone in our midst who can help us translate. What was Wycliffe known for? <laughs> so there I got my first job as a translator. In fact, as God's guidance and his hand has always been, that it was the beginning of a transformation. I'm still in transformative phase up to now. Many other things 
from that moment happened. And that also where, you know, I met these you know, amazing kids that, you know, they were in town by themselves on a, on a volunteer trip. And, you know, someone was charging, you know, I heard, overheard someone is charging them what I thought was, you know, a bit too much. So I approached them and, I, you know, I, I didn't speak to them. I spoke to the trader, the, the seller, and I said, what's the price? And he told me the price. And I said, if you don't charge them the same price, I'm going to take them away to another person so they can sell them. I felt these were English volunteer kids. They were in my town. I felt compelled to, to speak to this trader. That moment, that action, I never told myself to do it, even if I would love to tell myself that. Because how many people passed when those kids are buying in this market? One of those moments where you really appreciate God's work. And there, I stood for these kids to tell them that, you know what? If they don't charge you the same price they will charge me, I'm taking you somewhere. And I made it clear almost in the market. Since then, none of those kids got overcharged. But when I went back and these guys asked me, why did you, why, you know, why did you make us lose to be able to mark up? I said, if you, were ever, you ever found yourself in a strange land where you have no one, you better believe that once you find out that you've done that to you, you won't appreciate it. And in this chapter of mine, I call it the transformative experiences. And there is, um, there is a journey that really uh, intersects the resilience that we find, the suffering, all the things that, we, that I went through as a child, but also as growing up, that resilience taught me much. Of course, brought a lot of doubts too. But I believe that as a Christian, there is that moment in our lives where we live at a, at a junction of doubt and belief. And that's, it's very hard to pull ourselves in by ourselves if we don't have and don't believe in the grace of God. Very crucial. And I think this, that level or that chapter of my life taught me much about how the next chapters we are working. And that chapter of mine, the next one, I call it the chapter of using coffee, understanding that we have so much that the, the Lord has given us in those villages that we can utilize. But also that chapter allowed me to sympathize and understand how we can use tourism, on the other hand, to create impact. The chance encounter of these volunteers brought something very deep to me and allowed me to be able to um, to find a resolution of, of how I can help. Majority of those volunteers, they didn't come from very um, wealthy families, but they had one thing in common. They wanted to experience how it is to be in extreme situations. And the learnings from those, majority of them are Christians. But some of them could not afford to go on a safari. That hurt me. I made it a mission of my own to make sure that everyone should have an experience of an African safari without spending a fortune. And that was one of the beginnings of me starting the seed that once I go, once I grow, and I reach to this level, I want to do that. And that's where, that's one of the seeds that brought me to start um, San Futa, which is a safari business. But this is an experience 
That is a chapter. I call that chapter the triumph and the transformation. But also that chapter is very important. Very important because you remember the words of my mother that I will leave you in this world. But God will look after you. She was sorry, not for because she was dying. She's sad. She was sad because she thought she was going to leave me in this world that is full of people who will betray you. And she was right. But also she said something that was that really brings us to this point where the picture, the photo that you're seeing. She said to me, when I told her I want to be a lawyer, as my wife would it, I thought I was marrying a lawyer, a lawyer but I'm marrying a farmer now. Uh, that's how life uh, transforms and how it moves. But it's something that she said that was so transformative. I said to her, I want to be a lawyer, to Howard, to protect my soul, she says, do not put your hopes high, because that will never happen. I'm a man of belief. Even in a moment where I have no shillings in my pocket, there is something that tells me that it's possible. And I say to her, ma'am, I know no one in this village has ever done that, but I'm going to do it. I want you to imagine for a moment, we are talking about someone who's cooking outside, who has no shoes, someone who has only one short trousers, and one, one short, one for being able to go to school, another one to go to stay, um, to stay with. A, a person who is there who has more chances to be hopeless? And I said to my mom, I will do it. Just like any good mother, you love your mothers, don't you? Uh, just like any good mother, she turns out as I'm walking away, she says to me, but if you ever do it, do not forget these villages. That word, do not forget these villages, was the start of my call to purpose. I'll read this. Uh, I think it, you know, it would be helpful. Uh, Romans 8, 28, just when you get time. Um, and we know that in all things God works for good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I didn't know this was um, the series that you, you're running here at King's Church. Like Joseph, we can trust God is working all things together for ultimate good, even in the midst of adversity, even especially believe God more in those moments when things are going well. And in those moments when things are not going well. Because when a moment we start thinking that we are in charge, we have taken over, it's a very dangerous place to be. So I started Bootrack Coffee, one of the first black-owned, smallholder, African farmer brand in this country. The journey has been long, arduous, very interesting. But at the core are those words. Do not forget the village. You see, with purpose, you need you to believe the calling, to answer the calling, but you also you need people who can believe in you to come on those mission. And for whoever is here and is not married yet, I will tell you this. To do and fulfill the purpose for which you have been called, 
you need the right ingredient when you're choosing a partner, a wife or husband. Because for me, part of the reasons we are able to do what we're doing is because my wife has been there accepting that there is a calling on this man. And his purpose is to use businesses and use what he knows and his experiences, what he's gone through, to transform, to do a little bit for his kingdom. You see, we are, we cannot all be preachers, but we can all be serving God's kingdom in everything we are doing. My wife works for a care, uh, for a care company, I work for Croydon Council, and one of these things that she always tells me, you know, I don't go to work because I cannot look into my service users or my clients' faces and I just feel like this is work. This is something I do because I care for them. When you ask her, why didn't you leave? I couldn't because this is what I am for them. See, that is service and that is a calling, that's a purpose. All each of us have been called differently to do different, different, different tasks. And I think, I think before, um, before I conclude, there are some verses that I want you to look at, which is one, um, you know, James 1, 2 to 4. And when he says that, you know, consider it pure joy to go through these things. I'm paraphrasing this, but you can, you can have, you know, have a look at it and read it properly. So which is James 1, 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy as you're going through all these adversities, as you're going through all these things. In the, me, in the moment, one of you here may be going through unimaginable suffering or thoughts as we cross over on the other side. God is using us especially more in these moments, in these moments where we, we're almost putting our, all our, our hope in him. And that is something that I have learned. I'm still learning, surrendering myself to God. I don't think I'll ever fully learn because I'm learning every day. And because of that, I always start my day in the, everything I do. I started with understanding. And I think you, even you, I want you to start your day with this. I'm not worthy for his love. I'm not worthy to do what I do today. But because of him, who has and knows me more, because of his grace, I'm now okay with who I am. We are all not worthy at all, but because of his grace, we are. And with that, I would like to thank you and thank you so much. And I will always remember these moments, very much so. And I'll leave you with that photo of me almost in my way of saying, God, we are on the journey together. And this is where we are now. And together, we are building something not only for ourselves, but for your kingdom and your people. And we will create impact, lasting impact in those communities. But also, we will transform this country in the United Kingdom for the first time. No one, no one had ever brought a brand and built a brand and bought it, put it in Waitrose and put it in, in co-op as we are. And two more um, retailers are coming and we're gonna be launched everywhere. In the next five years, I want to be able to find Blue Truckle coffee everywhere in your houses. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank and bless your holy name. Thank you for your son. Wycliffe, 
Thank you for the journey Lord has gone through. Thank you because you are our Father. You've displayed your hand in his life. Lord, his life shows that we are not alone. We need to trust you. Even though people can reject us, but you are Lord, you will not reject us. Blessed be your holy name. Help us, Lord, to continue to exalt your holy name, Lord, in our journey through life, believing in Jesus, repenting of our sins, trusting him, and obeying him. Lord, we yield to you. Fill us again with your Holy Spirit that will fulfill your purpose to reach out wherever we are for you. In Jesus' name, amen.